Welcome to Purdue University College of Science Superheroes of Science podcast. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We will be discussing anything and everything related to the science classroom and interviewing scientists. Because as we know, the scientists are the superheroes behind the science. So join us as we learn about the scientists and explore current trends in K-12 science education. Welcome to Superheroes of Science. We are here with distinguished professor John Cushman from the Department of Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Science and also the Department of Mathematics. Let's simply start with what is it you're researching? Um, for this thing, for this uh, interview, I guess, it's, uh, we do, we're working with flow batteries, which is a kind of a, a very different sort of battery than you, you normally see because the electrolyte moves mm -hmm. and it's, it continually moves in the system as opposed to a standard battery where the electrolyte is fixed inside of a container, basically. Okay. And what do you mean by the electrolyte? It's the, ele the electrolyte is, um, whenever you have, when you produce a, a battery, you, the electrolyte is what keeps the electrons balanced. Because when, you, when you're when firing a current through the through, through a load, say, right, electrons are passing through it to, to make the motor run if it's a motor. Mm -hmm. um, but nature abhors of uh, uh, electrical imbalance. So if you're firing electrons one way, something has to counterbalance it going back the other way. Right? So the electrolyte is, contains salts in general, and salts disassociate mm -hmm. in whatever fluid they're in. And so cations go one way and anions go another way. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, you can never balance the electrons going through the, system, going through the, through the, through the load. Because as they go through the load, you have, you have to have something going counterbalancing it to keep electrical, electrical neutrality within the cell itself. And that's what the electrolyte's for. It's a, it's a lot, when those cations and anions disassociate, they, they keep the electrical potential of the whole system neutral. Okay. And it's, so it's a, incredibly important. That is a fantastic explanation. I taught that every year in chemistry, and I loved how you just explained that. Thank oh, you. Thank you. <laughs> chemistry excellent. teacher approved. Yes. <laughs> But how, okay, so explain to me, I mean, I, I have, well, it's Sarah's cell phone, but, oh. you know, who knows where mine is. Um, it, I know there's a battery in here, yep. but is there a liquid in that battery? Yeah, there is an electrical, there's an electrolyte that probably is, it could be a polymer, but it's most likely it's liquid. They also make solid state ones now and, um, and related batteries. But ours is very different because ours, actually, the system is always flowing. Okay. The electrolyte's always moving, and so, and, and what we do is instead of recharging the battery, you basically replace the electrolyte. Uh -huh. ah. So if you had a, if the idea is if you, if you had an electric car, for example, instead of taking your Tesla over and plugging it into a supercharger and let it, let it sit there for two hours or something, mm -hmm. or four hours or eight hours, whatever, depending on the system, um, our, our goal is to essentially say you, you go to like a gas station basically and you pump electrolyte into the system and drop the old electrolyte off and you just drive off. Okay. So you don't. So it's like a you know 15, 20 minute operation as opposed to like a gas fill up. Sure. As opposed to plugging in and waiting a couple hours. And another huge advantage of what we're doing is you don't have to rebuild the grid, the electrical grid for the company mm -hmm. for country because I mean if you put if you imagine millions of electrical cars charging themselves all the time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you we don't have the infrastructure to do anything remotely like that in the U.S. or anywhere else in the world for that matter. Um, so our goal essentially was to try and develop a battery where you don't have to destroy the infrastructure or rebuild the infrastructure just use the existing gas stations and oil change places and mm -hmm. things like that and so it's <coughs> i remember when like e85 came out and uh, they have separate pumps for those so yeah. are you envisioning down the road there'll be another pump there that no, that's, that's will essentially what we're looking for or, or change out to get rid of the gasoline all together and just you know change the gas station into an electrolyte station Okay. Now, electrolytes could be as simple as salt water. So yeah, ours is all salt water, by the way. Oh, okay, that's what, that was my question was, is is this something more tricky or more no, expensive? No, no, no. This, this, this is, is one of the beauties of the battery is that um, the electrolyte is basically an oxidant and a, a base and water. Okay. And the oxidant itself is also a salt. And when it breaks down, it turns into another salt. So it, it, when it reduces, mm -hmm. the the electrolyte, that we're, the oxidant that we're playing with, just reduces to a classical salt. Okay. A very common salt, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the real real advantages of it, is that this is, it's environmentally perfectly 
fine. I mean, it doesn't. There's no. There's no hazardous chemicals. Well, like yeah, the, the way you're telling me, because I'm thinking, okay, there's always some kind of byproduct, you know. Mm-hmm. If you yeah, have like, and, it, yeah. so, but your byproduct is there's two by there's two by big byproducts from what we do. One is you get salt water. Yeah. Okay. And you can take that salt that's in the salt water and convert it back to the oxidant by using electricity if okay. you want to. And then you start all over again so you can sure. continually recycle that oxidant. And the other is the anode is a metal. Okay. And when the anode breaks breaks down because it's 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 oxidizing. Mm-hmm. Um, what happens is it complexes with um, some of the compounds that are in the in the electrolyte. And it so it essentially sinks to the bottom of the cell. Mm-hmm. But if you look at what that if you look at what that component is, it's an intermediate in trying to get from the original ore for the metal to the final product of the metal. So it sits in the middle somewhere along that path of going from ore to metal. Okay. And right in that middle you can just you can just start recycling and just push it back into the metal nice. again. Yeah. So it's a you can just continually re- recycle the metal. And it's, it's, it's one this of the most like common metals. science metals. fiction stuff you're talking about. Really? This is like way <laughs> out there. You haven't got to the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, I'll tell you, the, the best story about what we're doing is that if you take, if you take three, say, three batteries, okay, and you hook them up in series, mm-hmm. the power is additive. So if this one produces yes. two watts and that is two watts and that's two watts, you end up with six watts, right? Well, ours, so it's a linear scaling. You know, it's just you add up over and over, two plus two plus two. It's linear mm-hmm. scaling. Ours would be, it's close to quadratic scaling. So if you have three cells, instead of having six watts, it's three squared, which is nine watts. Wow. So and the more you put in series, the, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's growing extremely. The power goes really fast with the number mm-hmm. you put in series. Wow. As opposed to going linearly. So uh-huh. it's growing almost squared. It's not quite squared. It's like 1.8. But it's going at a very high rate versus uh-huh. the, the usual system, so that's a, a big advantage of what we're we're doing. Good thing you're a mathematics professor too, because I got a feeling the math there is way over my head. Uh, it's trivial. Really, <laughs> it's trivial. <laughs> but it's, it's so that's that's one of the most important characteristics of what we got. The one drawback that we have is, if you look at something like a, a lithium ion battery, how do they make their power increase? They do it by just increasing the size of the cathode and the anode. Mm-hmm. So if you tear apart a lithium-ion battery, it's a big rolled-up mm-hmm. mess. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's rolled up because that just increases the, the size of the anode and the cathode. Mm-hmm. Because all, it's just the reaction sites that they have. As you increase the size of the anode and the cathode, you have more reaction sites. Mm-hmm. So you can generate more current, more power. Ours doesn't do that. Uh, ours is, ours, our way of increasing power is to put things in series. So instead of their way of increasing power is to increase the size of the anode and cathode. Mm-hmm. That doesn't do anything for us. We have to put them in series in order, to, in order to make it work. So what size right now with what you have, what size would it have to be to power a car? Interesting, good question. <laughs> <laughs> Since we haven't made it to a car yet, we're not... Yeah, I haven't <laughs> got up to the car level. <laughs> we haven't got to that level. Um, I, I can tell you what, we've been in, a, in a, like a four-foot section that's very thin... Uh-huh. I can, you know, generate like a half a kilowatt of, of power. Mm-hmm. Okay. And if you just imagine stacking a bunch of those together, you can see what's going to go on. Okay. And the longer I make the the um, the um, package of cells, the higher the power rating is. So I mean, like like say a, a four foot system right now might generate a half a kilowatt, mm-hmm. but if you just if you double that. You know, you way you're up into the, you know, like five kilowatt type mm-hmm. of thing, mm-hmm. even though you just doubled it, so. Hmm. So do you have, if you're replacing electrolyte, do you have individual cells or is it all just together and it's, it's all volume? There, there would be like a package of individual series of cells. Okay. So you'd have like a, a, a big series of cells in one little unit. And then you have another series of cells in another unit. Okay. Although, I mean, if you wanted to make just a little very long mm-hmm. pole, you could you could do something like that. But we that's not what we propose to do. Okay. Um, so they don't look like a normal battery. Like if you look if you look like like a Tesla car, they have thousands of these little batteries that are about this big, mm-hmm. round things. Um, ours would be very different. We'd have a bunch of long poles. Mm-hmm. In ours. But we always we also have a to have a pump mechanism because you're flowing the electrolyte through the whole system too. Right. So. Yeah. Where did you, 
how did you get to this? Yeah. What did you start with? I mean, it's I'm thinking, I, that's a really good question. There's a very long story behind that because we started about four years ago, and what got me involved with this was I work with Porsche Media. Like the ground is Porsche Media. That's the Eeps part of what I do. Um, but like Porsche Media are everywhere. This, you know, your walls poor, you're Porsche. There's was, was a person, you're a Porsche Media, your brain is Porsche, everything in you is Porsche. I work with Porsche Media. Okay, well, electrodynamics is really important in Porsche Media because, I mean, the charges are everywhere. I mean, you, your body works based on the electrical currents passing through your porous body. So anyway, so that's why that's my specialty is, is porous media, and I just concentrate in recent years on electrodynamics and porous media. And one of the biggest weaknesses of most classical batteries is they have membranes, and the membranes tend to break down, okay. and then the battery is shot, it you know, shorts right. out. So what, what I said, well, let's get away from using membranes and just use, say, two immiscible fluids in a porous media. Immiscible means they just don't mix. They sit there side by side, and this one stays here, and that one stays there, and there's no membrane. Okay. So that was my idea of to get rid of the membrane. The problem with that idea is that almost all fluids that don't mix are involve an organic and an inorganic, a polar yeah. and a nonpolar, because yeah. polar <coughs> and nonpolar don't like each other. Okay. So they stick apart. They stay apart. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem when you have a nonpolar liquid is you, it's very hard to get a salt to disassociate in it because the reason salt's disassociated is because you put them in a polar medium that tries to break them apart. Polar just means positives over here in an atom and negatives over here, and so they try to take a salt and, and disassociate it. Yeah. When you have a nonpolar medium, the salt doesn't want to disassociate; it just wants to sit there. If you can even get it dissolved in the, in the liquid. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but there turned out to be a really simple way around that, and that's if you use something like ethanol in water or methanol in water, mm -hmm. which normally are completely miscible. Mm -hmm. But when you dump a lot of salt in them, the ethanol separates from the water. So you end up with two immiscible phases, and they're both polar, because ethanol and methanol are both polar, also, well, not near as polar as water, but they're both polar, which is really a nice thing, because now I can have ethanol sitting next to the water, and they both will dissolve salts, but they have methanol is not nearly as good as water, but it does dissolve certain salts. Mm -hmm. So you can have two electrolytes side by side that don't mix, and you get rid of the membrane, which is which is nice. We patent a whole bunch of things on, on the, along that line, but that's not what we ended up doing because by accident one day I was putting some of the oxidant onto the um, anode side, and I thought it would just short the system out, and it made the power go up. <laughs> Because if you put the oxidant, I mean, if you put the oxidant on top of the anode, you should have a redox reaction right on the anode, mm -hmm. and nothing happens. You don't get any current that way. But so when I did this and the power went up, I was like, "Well, that doesn't make any sense to me." <laughs> um, so I started exploring with that, and I said, "Well, if I can do that, what do I need the? What do I need two fluids for? I can just do this in one fluid." Mm. And. It turns out there's a very good reason for why it did what it did, and that, something I didn't mention was this battery can also produce a lot of hydrogen. So you have two choices with the battery. You can either produce electricity to run a motor, or you can produce hydrogen to run a fuel cell to run a motor. Either way, you're going to get electricity, mm -hmm. or you can do anything in between. Mm -hmm. So you can skew it to more electricity or skew it to more hydrogen or whatever you want, basically. And so you have really two reactions that are taking, two important reactions that are taking place. One is the formation of hydrogen, and the other is the, the generation of electrical current by reduction of the oxidant. And the formation of hydrogen is well known in systems like we're playing with to, to result from the fact that when the water molecules get close to the anode and the anode wants to um, oxidize, what happens to the water is it breaks into a proton plus hydroxyl group, mm -hmm. and then a couple of electrons that are coming off the oxidizing metal come to the two protons, and that forms hydrogen gas. So you have a reduction reaction on the anode, which should take, which should kill off the battery, but it doesn't. <laughs> and then what happens with the the, the electrical side of the, of the system is that the, the oxidant, even though it's embedded in the electrolyte and is in touch with the anode, it only reduces on the cathode the cathode current collector, which is also a very odd thing because you say, well, why doesn't it just reduce on that, on the metal just like the hydrogen does? Yeah. And the reason is because it's a very big molecule and it can't compete with the little protons that are sitting there trying to take electrons from the, from the, from the metals. So the so other electrons then fire around to the cathode side because mm -hmm. it's all a conductor. 
and that's where the elect that's where the electricity comes from. Because then the the big oxidant that's sitting there now now reduces on the cathode, and so you have on the anode you have hydrogen production on the cathode you have electricity that's coming through the through the circuit, and between the two of them, and well, <laughs> the, the, another important story is you can you can adjust how much hydrogen is produced or how much electricity is produced by how many of these things you put in series. Okay. So that, and that we don't fully understand how that works yet, uh, which it's a really interesting research problem actually. But that's what's going on in the system. So, yeah. This is, this is so fantastic to hear all this. I just think I would, I would have played this in a Chem One class. This is everything they need to know. They could write out the reactions. This is per. This is excellent. Well, I appreciate excellent that. electrochemistry. This I and mean, this there's is something that there's many many high school students have to work through this very thing. And the problem that I had was I didn't have an application for it. We were just learning it to learn it. Yeah. This is amazing. Yeah. And we have like eight hundred pages of patent wow. applications on file for all this oh stuff. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how did you, you personally, how did you get interested when, as a, where did you, where did your interest in science come from? I had a seventh grade teacher by the name of Mr. Pennington. Okay. I still remember his name and you have no idea how long ago that was. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I wasn't really that interested in science until I took his class and he, he did interesting things like he gave us. A ping pong. I can remember all a lot of experiments. Was he gave us a ping pong ball, a, a couple, a light bulb, a shadow box, and it says, and then some other, a few other things. It says figure out how far the the, uh, the moon is from the Earth. <clears throat> and then we had another one was he gave me you know a piece of quartz and a rotating drum. We put the quartz in the water and the drum and rotate it around. And then he gave us a topo map of the Grand Canyon and he said figure out how old the Grand Canyon is. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> and what? so he gave us, he gave us, and he, he, we did thermodynamic experiments, even though we didn't know we were doing them right. at the time. So all kinds of interesting things like this, and I just, that just, I just dove into that, and I was right. like, you know, was just, that was for me, that was the most fantastic course I've ever, ever not course, but teacher I've ever had. Wow. And it was just a lot of fun. And that got me interested in science, and I've been interested in science ever since. Ever since, huh. I like that. So when you, did you decide, well, so, so you were that seventh grade and you thought, oh, this is very interesting. I'm going, I like science. And then as you graduated, were you thinking, I'm going to go to college for, for, to study science or? Well, at that point, I wasn't thinking that far ahead. You weren't thinking that far ahead. <laughs> no, but I mean, when I got through high school, that's, you know, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go into science and mathematics. And okay. See where it led me. And for a while, I thought I'd be a high school teacher, and then I did my student teaching, and I decided I wanted to go to college and get grad grad, grad degrees, and just went from there. And I, I got my I got two PhDs in three years, wow. oh. <laughs> which was pretty pretty <laughs> hectic at, at the time. <laughs> I would <laughs> say so. Mercy. So what did you? What was your major when you went? Well, to I was in environmental science in the X school actually. And mathematics, applied mathematics in the, in the school of science. Okay. Um, and and people ask, well, how in the world can you mix those two things? Well, I mean, environmental science, a lot of that has to do with what happens in the soils in the ground and deeper deeper formations. And if you do it right, you can turn a lot of that into mathematics mm -hmm. and put it on a computer, and, which is what everybody does nowadays. Mm -hmm. They weren't doing it so much when I was doing it, but it's what everybody does now. So mathematics can play a huge role in the the environment, and, and so that's what I've, I've done most of my life. But um, I've worked in lots of different fields of engineering and biomedical, and I mean we've, we're all over the place. Because I work with porous media, and porous media, as I said, are mm -hmm. essentially everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's very little you can't find that's not porous if you look on the right scale. So what's <laughs> What's the, I want to say weirdest, weirdest or most interesting project that you've worked on? What we're doing right now. Right there you go. <laughs> I should I'm have not kidding saw you. that coming. There's <laughs> always a new thing. that Something just pops out like, wow. <clears throat> and all we're doing is follow, I, all I do is follow the data around. You know, wherever it leads me, that's where we head. Then I have a couple of very, three very, very good engineers that are working with us that are building things for, like the car you saw moving around. Mm -hmm. the, <clears throat> and we were playing with um, like forklifts and stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. and then 
this, we got this military stuff that we're trying to get involved with and several companies that we're trying to be involved with. <clears throat> so now it's as much engineering as it is science. So most of the science is done. It's not all explained. Yeah. But a lot of it's done. But another beauty of this battery is, um, and this is what we're running a lot of experiments on right now, is that it's very well suited for cold weather. If you know batteries, batteries thermodynamically do not work well in yeah. the cold. They just they want to just collapse and die. Mm -hmm. Well, and the beauty of our battery is that the production of hydrogen in the battery is a very exothermic reaction. So it heats up. So you can put this in 35 below climate and it'll be hot. Oh. And so you know you, you get reduction in the performance, but you don't get the kind of thing you get with a typical battery because it's got its own it's got its own heat engine sitting there, which is another beauty of it. That's one of the reasons also trying to sell it to the military. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you said you follow data around. Yeah. So what sort of data are you collecting with this, or what sort of data are you looking at? Well, right now, what we're most interested in is the max power for the cell, and there's a little theorem that says the max power is when you put a load on the, what you do is you match your resistance to, um, well, you look for the internal resistance of the battery. When you're at the internal resistance of the battery, you'll be at max power. And there's this little theorem, theorem of, in, in electronics that, that'll show that very simply. So what we're looking at, we, we put the battery on, onto a load device and we adjust the resistance in the load device and watch the current change. Mm -hmm. And or the power change, however you want to look at it. And we're searching for the optimal resistance, which is when you get to that optimal resistance for the current, mm -hmm. that turns out to be the internal resistance of the battery. And so we're looking for the internal resistance of the battery to maximize power from the battery. And that's a, one of our key experiments. And one of the, it's another bizarre thing. There's just so many bizarre stories <laughs> as what we're doing. Um, uh, uh, typically, when you, when you take a look at the internal resistance of a battery, you put a couple of them in series. You know, the battery, the internal resistance doubles and triples because essentially they're additive again. Mm -hmm. Ours, for a lot of batteries in series, either stays the same or actually goes down the internal resistance, which is... It goes down in resistance. Yes. And, but there's a good reason for that, too, because the typical batteries, when you put them side by side in, in the series confinement, in a series arrangement, they're isolated. Right, so this one sees that one through the cathode, sees the anode, and the cathode sees the anode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the electrolytes are all separated in okay. every battery, right? So they're, they're like, I think it was two C cells stuck together. Yeah. Okay, well, ours is different than that because what we do, our anodes and cathodes are arranged just like they would in a series for a normal battery, but they have the same common electrolyte. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a huge difference in the electronics of what's going on in that battery. Instead of having all the electrolytes isolated and sticking the batteries together in series, ours has a common electrolyte. So even though we say they're in series arrangement, te te technically they're not in series because the electrolyte's common through the whole oh. battery because it's flowing through the whole arrangement. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's why even though that you normally intuitively say the internal resistance should go up as I add more of these cells mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. it in fact doesn't go up. It stays fairly constant or sometimes actually goes down. Which is pretty wild. Is that a good thing? That's a great thing, because that's that's why the power is going up. Right. With it's it's one to the almost squared power instead of that's what we believe is why it's going up like that. Wow. Yeah. So it's 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 cool. I mean, it has lots of uh, nobody's seen anything like this before. By the way, this is all new stuff to everybody. So <laughs> I've not we, heard of it. That's I'm not sure. either. Well, I'm thinking all these different could, things you that would, we see. You, you would talk to most. Um, um, people that work with, with batteries and you say I'm going to put my oxidant right in the electrolyte and I'm going to embed the anode and the cathode current collector right in that electrolyte and they say that thing will never work because the oxidant will just simply reduce on the on the anode and you will get no current. Yeah. You get an oxidation reduction reaction, there's no electrons transferred to the, to the load. And I, you, we've talked to some really good, and one person was in one of the head editors for, what was it? one of the big electronics journals, said, no way it's going to work. <laughs> so, so, so I brought him into the lab. <laughs> I didn't tell him I already had it working. So I brought him into the lab and I showed him. He's like, he's just kind of eyes rolled up and he's like, wow, how does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> how does that happen? <clears throat> so there's a lot of cool stuff that's in there. It's, it's, yeah. 
That is really cool. <laughs> I agree. That, that one kind of blew me away. Sorry. It, wow. Mm-hmm. What? I don't know. I'd ask you where we'd go next with this, but it seems like you're already going where we would go next. We just, you know, we just follow the data. Wherever it leads us, that's where, that's where we go. Um, and like I say, now it's a lot of it's in the engineers' hands because they're trying to build, you know, devices that actually mm-hmm. use the technology. That it, in and of itself is an interesting challenge too. It, that's what one of the things. As soon as you said that the project's kind of in, in engineers' hands, the, I really liked because in the schools we so we talk so much about STEM. Yeah. You know the science. This is, this is all STEM. I mean, and it's your project is. I mean, that Perfect is STEM. real life. <laughs> it involves life. engineering. It involves <laughs> science. It involves all kinds of different fields, actually. Oh, I'm seeing a cross field. Holy yeah. cow! The <laughs> physics that you're using and the chemistry you have to have in there, then the earth science side. Understand yeah. it's you. That that's about as interdisciplinary as you can come. Yeah. Here's another interesting aspect of the battery that we've used, and that's when you saw that scooter, mm-hmm. that the little golf cart. Uh huh. Okay. Well, typically when you look at a, a vehicle running on hydrogen, which is that that one was actually running on, we had had electricity generated too, but to run the devices in the in the cart. But the fuel cell is being run on hydrogen. All right. Well, a typical hydrogen powered car has these 10,000 PSI tanks of hydrogen sitting mm-hmm. in the car, and you replace the tank, tanks of hydrogen all the time to mm-hmm. keep to, to use the fuel cell. Well, those are actually 10,000 PSI. is not something you want to play around with if you don't have to. No, it's, it sounds... It's like a bomb in your car. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That yeah. sounds it's, like it's, something it's, would blow it's up. It's alarming. It's, it's like a bomb in a car, basically. Well, because of the way ours work, works it's um, hydrogen produced on demand instead of having to have a tank full of hydrogen compressed you just make hydrogen as you go and so you can run it at like 30 psi which is a sounds much safer it's way safer mm-hmm. than, than, the, than the other way of doing this that's less uh, pressure than my tires yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. In fa- if in fact yeah. if you look at that scooter those two black tanks on the back are just paint canisters you know, if you're using a spray paint, mm-hmm. that usually run at 60 psi. Okay. But this, those were 30, 30 psi for that. <coughs> and we'll device. say what you're mentioning is the video, right? Yeah, the video. And we will make in the show description a link to that video yeah. so everyone will be able to see. Yeah, you'll find it fast. That's, they, sh- they should find that very fascinating, actually. It was very well done by PRF. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it was. A, I thought it was well done. It was. That's so cool. <laughs> So your data, let's say data is going smoothly, the engineers are designing what they need to design, and you find yourself with a free weekend. What would you do if you had nothing else going on? What what do you do for fun? We'll work on houses. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I do. You flip houses? Or no, I don't flip houses. No, I, just, no. I just fix houses. Fix houses. Yeah. Okay. So I, I built most of my own house, actually. Oh. Not all of it, but most of it. So you're into carpentry or just, just kind of everything? The carpentry, the you know, lighting, all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. I, can, I can do almost all that. Well, very I good. just make it up as I go. Wow. <laughs> okay. I find that's the best way because I can't follow a plan. <laughs> and I keep changing my plans. Yeah, absolutely. I don't like that wall tearing up and another one in. Oh. Yeah, I don't like that window tearing up and another one in. It's, it's just a hobby. Okay. But you said houses, and so are there multiple houses you're working on? Well, right now, um, a, f- a friend of mine up in on the south side of Chicago has a couple of houses that needed a lot of work to make them livable, actually. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I'm working on right now. Oh, okay. So that's why I buzzed down here. From, I went up yesterday afternoon and came back this morning because I was up there doing that stuff. Okay. Putting, putting, actually putting new windows in and mm-hmm. something, so... I like it. So you're the first person that told us that for uh, their spare time they spend usually working on houses. <laughs> what most people do for a living. <laughs> I'm hearing reading and hiking. hiking. Well, I, mean, I, yeah, I like to fish and oh. things like hunting fish too, but that's okay. a different, different yeah. Nice. I spend three weeks in the Bounty Waters every year. Wait, three weeks where? The Minnesota Canadian Bounty Waters oh. every year. Oh, wow. I have since my dad started to take me up there years and years and years ago. I won't say how long ago. <laughs> <laughs> That'll date me too much. Well, what's your, what's your favorite thing to fish for? A walleye fisherman. Oh, yeah, I turned it into an art form. Nice. Okay. I, I've, I've never been walleye fishing. I'm embarrassed to say. I love that. It's, it's, it's 
so I really have turned it into an art form too. I make my own tackle and oh. <coughs> yeah. Excellent. That is very cool. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you stopping by and chatting with the podcast. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It's uh, these have been going quite well. A lot of uh, we're getting really good feedback from teachers. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you love superheroes of science, be sure to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast player. Be sure to join us as we add interviews of scientists and incorporate discussions of current trends in K-12 science. Until next time, be super and remember, you are someone's hero. Boiler up. Hammer down. <laughs>